Here we are again. Here we are again in the rapidly changing man cave. Two days no rain. That means steelhead fishing is on my horizon. Of course my truck is having issues. I think the wiring harness is screwing up because I have no gauges, no dash lights, and the wipers are staying on. Hmm. Great. What else? Some unfortunate luck here. Uh, ah, it sucks. It sucks when you have to tell a teenage girl that her pet was killed. That sucks ass. Went down yesterday. That sucks, eh? This is suck that we're as Sarah's pretty upset. Unfortunately, one of the favorite cats got killed out back here. What sucks about that is in the the stress and the sadness and the shitty deal of having to break the news to somebody is that we're all raised to feel that death is the most horrible thing ever when it probably isn't in reality. And we all, every single thing on the face of this planet dies. Everything. So why are we raised to react so shocking and upset about it? I wonder. I wonder why. Anyway, there's a topic we were talking about yesterday before our sweet teenager came home and and um, had to be faced with the fact that her favorite pet was no longer with us. It really sucks. Real sinking, shitty feeling in your stomach when you have to uh, go through that, isn't it? Really shitty. But anyway, moving along. Moving along, because nothing ever stops, so we're going to keep ripping here, all right? Here we go. Who do we got? Who do we got? Now, the emails, quick note, I get, I always, I usually get a lot of people emailing in to ask if they can, they'll, they're willing to give me a hand with emails. But the reality is, you guys, and I appreciate, I appreciate every single word of kindness. Every single one. First off and foremost, all right? But here's the reality about helping me reading emails on this channel. We can't read three at a time. Unfortunately, we can't listen to three at a time. We can't listen to four at a time. It's not going to happen. On this YouTube channel, they have to be read one by one. Right? So, and furthermore, and I appreciate everyone. And what what would I do? Would I, would I sign over access to my email account, which has about seven different emails in it, all my personal items access to my domain names to stranger from the internet right can't do that either so what do we do just keep going you can't listen to more than one at a time anyway another thing too i've had a few people write wrote into me raging about my disorganization <laughs> listen about emails from the 2020 being read and two years ago three years ago what i have been doing is reading from recent to back in the beginning, right? Mixing it up back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I'll tell you what, for anybody out there who might have a sniveling thing about them where they want to complain, maybe you could get 30,000 emails and uh, you can show us the right thing to do with 30,000 emails. Lead by example. You know, it's funny when people go on, I was going to make a little meme or something or say something the other day, a little sarcastic about that. It's like, well, I woke up today. What am I going to do today? I think I'm going to go onto YouTube, find a YouTube channel, and I'm going to blow a gasket because I don't think they're doing what I want them to do with it. They're not doing it the right way. <laughs> Said no intelligent mind ever. You know, I have a contractor. I had people work for me for years, and there was nothing worse than somebody telling me that something needed to be done. Do it. You don't tell somebody something needs to be done. You do it. Right? You do it. If you think somebody's doing something the wrong way, do it the right way. Do You do it the right way. Instead of sitting on your ass doing nothing. So there you go. Um, it's no secret what happened with my phone. I had over 2,500 emails in order on this phone or was it the other phone? whatever and it got wiped and those 2500 emails 
were from my inbox. And as soon as I copied them and pasted them into my notes, they were marked as red in my inbox. So, show me how to deal with that one the right way, right? Another thing, too, is I've begged people to please send the emails to sharemystoryhowtohunt.com. People go out of their way and find every little squeaky, absolute possible possible way they might get a hold of me. They email it to my personal email. They put it in social media messages. They, they put it on the, the phishing booking. They'll slip it in. They'll slip emails in there. They'll slip emails into Sarah. Could you please give this to Steve? I find emails everywhere. Everywhere. I've got like six or seven different emails that are, are meant for specific things in my life. And all the people out there think that, well, maybe I'll just try this one. Sorry, I'm going to use this email. Right? So... There you go. That's what I'm up against. 30,000 emails coming in from all different angles and showing up where they shouldn't be. And people out there being frustrated because I'm not doing it right. I'm so disorganized. <laughs> there you go. There's my rant for the morning, all right? Well, one thing I can tell you, though, is I have zero patience for snivelers of any type when it comes to any topic. There's nothing worse than complainers that complain about somebody not doing it right right you always lead by example you never snivel you do it right you do it right you take the you take the wheel and you do it right and lead by example or shut the fuck up <laughs> right there you go now listen to this <laughs> here's listen to the title of this one why some are so mad and others are not is a title of email steve just saw your latest post we asked how come Sabe are the way they are. My name is Frank Arnold from North Carolina, and you can use my name as I am almost 74, retired, and I do not care what people think of me. My fellow free human being, club member. Never have. This explanation is kind of deep, so hold on. I've studied the subject for many years, and it has always led me to more paths and doors to open for knowledge, which I now know is never-ending. So here goes. We who are on this world now, especially us older ones, have been reincarnated. Yeah, I know I'm going there. And a lot of us are here to resolve karma from the past. Especially for what we did in the last days of Atlantis. I told you to hold on. Black magic was rampant at the end of this period and evil experimentation was done on people, animals, and anything else they could procure. It really was diabolical. The higher priest class was in charge, and they thought they were above everybody and could do anything without any consequences. From what I understand, the Sabe of today are remnants of this past. People of today that are having really tough times with the Sabe are apparently resolving past evil deeds they, that they deserve for what they did. Karma. Well, other people have either calm experiences or enlightening knowledge shared i guess the old adage of you reap what you sow really is true lifetimes are successive whether you pay in this lifetime or the next makes no difference you got so bad so evil in the end days of atlantis that our creator or whatever you want to call this higher force god had had enough from what i've learned atlantis was completely destroyed within 24 hours by the great flood they were warned repeatedly, but failed to correct their paths. I know many will poo-poo these words, but that's okay too. I'm sure there are other explanations to explain what is going on with the Sabe, and I'm looking for more answers on this subject. As you yourself realize now, we are not alone in this world, and never have been. Share this if you want, and if you don't want to, that's okay too. Always watch your back, as there are still a lot of evil people slash beings out there. The more truthful knowledge you share, the bigger that red target is on your back. We really are living in exciting times. Frank, the old dude from North Carolina. Frank, there you go, man. Appreciate the input. And as you know, Frank, some people are going to call you a kook. Some people are going to agree. And some people are going to be knee-jerked to email me in and say you're correct and add more. Do I know that is true myself? Nope. But it's sitting on a shelf in my head, waiting for that pattern, waiting for my links to uh, link up. 
with all my various shelves I have in my head, which is a lot. Sounds interesting to me. But it's so funny, though, you know, it's like when you're born, it's a confusing thing being alive, isn't it not? You know, we're born a baby. Apparently, we don't know shit. And all of a sudden, we are guilt-ridden and told we have been bad. We have to pay. And if you don't do this, you're going to pay. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's kind of bizarre. God's going to punish everybody if we do all these dirty deeds. Well, we're not born with all the knowledge. So if we're not born with the knowledge, it's kind of not fair, is it? Isn't it? It's like throwing somebody into a game with a whole pile of rules and not telling them what's going on. And then punishing them for being wrong. Does that make any sense? It's an amazing ride, is it not? The guilt. Guilt's a shitty human characteristic, man. Guilt is a nasty one, and I've always felt that anyone who imposes guilt and tries to make someone feel guilt, you are one evil son of a bitch. Right? That's a dirty thing. Now, listen to this. Who's next? Greetings from Temecula. <laughs> I probably didn't pronounce it right. California. I did a photo shoot in Yosemite National Park on a Saturday afternoon. I took the wife and the kids, figuring we could get a free trip out of it. It's an hour drive from the cabin to the entrance of Yosemite. By the time the photo shoot was done, it was dark. All right, so I'm gathering you're a paid photographer. I decided to head back since, since I was with the family and I'm not familiar with the roads. It had been snowing all day, so I didn't want to get stuck somewhere along the way. As I'm heading down the mountain, I look up and see bright stars covering the sky. I realized it had just stopped snowing, so I tell the wife to pull over. As I get out, I tell her to lock the doors and roll the windows all the way up since it was cold. Locked the doors because it was cold. <laughs> just kidding. I walk 20 feet away from the car while on the road, so going back to where we came from, I take a 15 second delayed shot in order to capture more light. And this is called a long exposure shot. And before I'm done, I hear twigs across the street to my right breaking as if someone was walking on them. I wasn't sure, but just to be safe, I, ru I ruined the photo by not letting it finish and picked up my tripod and walked back towards our car. This sounds familiar. I may have read this. I got next to our car. I felt a little safe, but was still looking in the direction where I heard the twigs break. I click the button on my camera again to start the 15 second delay, and now I hear a woman's voice say hello. It sounded about 100 feet or so to my right, and it wasn't in the same direction of where the twigs broke. It was directly to my right deep in the forest. The hello sounded welcoming, but out of place. I looked around in disbelief and thought, who the hell? I was so tempted to say hello right back, but as I looked, I couldn't see anyone. Since it sounded somewhat, since, since it sounded somewhat far, I didn't feel any danger, but was on edge. I was looking into the woods the entire time until my camera clicked, indicating that the photo was done. As soon as the camera clicked, I put my hand on the camera, and as soon as I turned my head to look at the back of it, I see the photo. Sorry, I put my hand on the camera, and as soon. As I turn my head to look at the back of it to see the photo, I hear the woman's voice say hello again. But this time it sounded as if it was only 20 feet away. The hello was like when you ignore your girlfriend. She says, hello. Kind of like saying, don't ignore me. The tone, <clears throat> excuse me, the tone was more of a sweet and loving manner and not hostile and creepy. It felt as if it wanted me to let my guard down. As you see, it's not a wide road, and I thought, how the hell did the voice get so close to me in a matter of seconds? I got so mad at myself when telling this part because I froze trying to figure out how she or it got so close to me without me hearing or seeing anything since I was looking everywhere while my camera was doing its thing. I was trying to figure it out while on the road, and all of a sudden I thought to myself, go, dumbass. <clears throat> Excuse me. I take, I take a trap, <clears throat> excuse me, I got my tripod and I jumped into the car and told my wife, let's go, as I, f as I threw $6,000 worth of gear into the car. I was trying to make sense of it, 
on the drive back to the cabin, but I couldn't. Forty minutes later, we get to the cabin, and I figured I would tell the wife what happened the next morning, since we since she wouldn't be able to sleep if I had told her there and then. When I wake up, I saw my wife sitting up in the bed. I asked her how she slept, and she said she hadn't. I asked her why, and she said because of the woman saying hello. <laughs> Excuse me, I asked her, how does she hear anything if the windows were up? She looked at me like she said, like she didn't know what I was talking about, so I proceeded to tell her what happened. She said, no, babe. Last night, as soon as you went to sleep, I went to go check up on the kids, and I heard a woman outside of the cabin saying hello. I looked outside and saw nothing, so I figured it was my imagination. She said she came to bed after a couple of minutes, not seeing anything, and a little bit after the woman said hello again, but sounded as if she had pressed her lips against the door. I asked her why she thought that, and she said because it sounded as if she had gotten in, but when she went to look, nobody was there. She then said she woke up, <clears throat> she woke me up, and she thought she had heard some something. When I heard nothing, she said I went back to sleep. I was so upset I told her that. I think I hear something is one thing, and someone is, up, is outside is another. I wasn't too mad at her because I understood the fear that she felt. We had the whole day for us, and we used it driving back home. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm one of those men that always believe that everyone has a phone to record something, and when people talk about the, the things about things and there's no video or any kind of proof, I always feel like it's not true because everyone has a phone in their pocket. This experience humbled me and shut me up because when fear hits you, you're not thinking rationally. And that's one of the many things that go out the window when dealing with something surreal. I want to thank you for giving me and many others a voice. If it weren't for you, I would still have been needing to tell my story. I have another story that will email you about the same cabin. The same night. All right. And there is the photo. It's a pretty nice photo, actually. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a creepy one. Hearing a voice from nobody, it's going to creep anybody out. You may have sent me a story. Your photography looks familiar. But we'll see, won't we? Now, what else do we got? I wonder how many of you out there are actually writing down patterns and studying this thoroughly and taking the information and doing something with it. I wonder how many of you are actually doing that, writing down the patterns. I'm going to write down the patterns and I'm going to put in a book. Speaking of books, I've got two on the go. I started writing two books I've been putting off forever. One for hunting and one for this topic. When we left, I don't know how many pages I've got into them, but I've got a lot. And I think the hunting one's coming out first, by the looks of it. It's easier. Anyway, sorry. All right, here we go. No title on this email. I'm convinced the encounter I had the fall of 79 in the woods of Michigan was a real Sasquatch slash Bigfoot encounter. Not a sighting. Age 14, a friend and I set up an old cabin tent in the woods on my brother's property. I think he probably mentioned old. At age 14, a friend and I set up an old cabin tent in the woods on my brother's property. Five acres, about 300 yards from the house for a weekend camp out. It's a rural farming community. Small town, dirt roads, quiet. About 1 a.m. that evening, we we're still awake. The five dogs we had all filed in through the broken door zipper of the old tent. These were typical farm tents. They lived outside, ran in their pack on the property and wherever else they would wander off to. They were not trained, just watches the property, crude and rude pets. After entering the tent, these dogs transformed into well-mannered creatures, quietly straining to listen for the bipedal footfalls that were approaching. Thinking it was my brother out for a midnight, atta midnight attack, 
On camp, I called out his name, letting him know his sneak attack was foiled. No response. The sound of the footsteps continued, passed, and faded in the distance, and all the dogs left the tent not to return for the remainder of the night. Next day, I talked to my brother about his failed midnight raid, and he did not know what I was talking about. Sunday evening. News. A 200-pound pig was seen being carried off by a large creature slash thing, and that was the next town over. Listening to your videos, you spoke of how some dogs reacted. You'd think that the way dogs react to a bear would be similar. They just must know Bigfoot is not one to be messed with. I believe I witnessed that dog behavior in the fall of 79. Not the most exciting Bigfoot encounter. I'm glad it turned out the way it did. Because at that age, I'm almost sure it would have, been, it would have kept me out of the field. And I would have never went on the hunting adventures I did. Thanks for the channel. Okay, man, appreciate that. So I gather, you uh, set up the tent. The dogs, they were normally running around outside, came into the tent. You probably forgot to say they were shitting themselves and sat there all quiet while this two-footed thing went walking by. And they didn't freak out and go running after it like they should have. And there you go. There's another club member, right? Another one. What's this? Another one. Mark, this is red. Sabe encounters in New Mexico and California. Hey, Stephen, you used my first name. It's Greg. I've been following your channel for a couple of years, but never emailed you with my Sabe experiences. I figured there was nothing unique about my encounters that hasn't already been shared by others. But maybe the locations and different kinds of experiences I've had would be helpful, helpful for you and the others in the club and no return to here. The first encounter was in the fall of 89 or 90. I was living in Taos, 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 <laughs> New Mexico at the time. I don't know how big that town is, but I, I learned a lot from a wildlife biologist named Stet Edmonds that lived there. He's passed on now. Maybe you knew him. I moved there from the East Coast to indulge my passions for skiing, hiking, mountain biking, and backpacking. My farmer former girlfriend and I drove about seven or eight miles out of town on RTE 518, also known as the High Road to Taos. This road runs through the Carson National Forest in the Sangre de Cristo range of the Southern Rockies. We pulled over at the trailhead to do some hiking. After about a half a mile, we came to an area where two large flat rocks faced a steep hillside that was covered with a very dense forest of new growth aspen and pines. I suggest we take a break and sit on the rocks to meditate, something I was into at the time. About 15 minutes into our sitting in silence, we were disturbed by the loud sounds of something very large and heavy crashing down the hillside in front of us, snapping up limbs, branches, and trees as it did. It stopped at the bottom of the hill directly across from where we were sitting. Whatever this was, it was massive. However, because of the denseness of the forest, we could not see through the stand of trees to identify what had caused such a commotion. Startled, my girlfriend asked, What's that? I said, I don't know. And I was immediately overcome with a strong sense of fear and dread, the likes of which I've never experienced before in the mountains. I said we needed to leave immediately, and so we double-timed it back to the parking lot. My fear did not subside until we were a couple of miles down the road on the way back to town. Interestingly, I asked her several years later if she remembered this incident, and she said she did not, and I certainly do. I eventually moved to the San Francisco Bay Area in Northern California, where I, where I resumed hiking and backpacking in the High Sierra and the other areas of the state. One of my favorite destinations for backpacking was the <clears throat> excuse me, Marble Mountain Wilderness in North Central California near the Oregon border. Rugged, remote, and secluded is how I would describe this area. The Marble Mountains are east and slightly north of Bluff Creek. In fact, to access the western portion of this wilderness, one has to drive north on California Route 96, a.k.a. the Bigfoot Highway, through the Hoopa Valley Reservation, where Dave Pilatus's Pilatus did 
research for his book, The Hoopa Project. Just a little further north to the west is a fire road that heads up into the coast range of the Klamath Mountains to Bluff Creek, which is where Patterson and Gimlin filmed the footage of Patty. The Marble Mountains, along with an adjacent wilderness area called the Trinity Alps, comprise almost a million acres of pristine backcountry, accessible only by foot and horseback. It's known for many sightings slash encounters with the forest people. On or around the summer of 2008, I did a solo backpacking trip to the Sky High Lakes Basin in the Marble Mountains. I was accompanied by the stalwart... Oh, sorry. I was accompanied by my stalwart Black Lab Coco. We set up camp about 100 yards from Lower Sky High Lake in a flat forested area. On the second day of our three-night stay, Coco and I did a... St- Dunning day hiked the nearby Marble Rim. Upon the return of our upon the return to our campsite, I was surprised to find a very large mushroom cap arranged on a rock near my tent. There were no other campers nearby who would have placed it there. This is an experience of was this an experience being gifted? I guess I'll never know. Well side note in case I forget to later, uh, squirrels put mushrooms everywhere. I used to think that too, we'd be riding along on our horses in the middle of nowhere, going down the trail for sometimes 12 hours straight. And I remember the first time I became aware of it years ago, I kept seeing mushrooms sitting in the in the crook of branches up the trunk of the tree. I level with me and shit. I'm like, oh, there's another mushroom. Weird. And then I saw the squirrels putting them there. That's all I know about mushrooms being placed so far. On the final day, I decided to take a different route back to the trailhead. Coco and I hiked to the Pacific Coast Crest Trail, which is about 800 vertical feet up a ridge which rimmed the north side of the basin. There we encountered another backpacker who had spent the previous night at nearby Shadow Lake. I asked him how his stay was there, and he replied, cryptically, spooky. I regret that I didn't ask him for a further explanation. Just past the turnoff to Shadow Lake, Coco went on point, her ears erect, as she intently stared at an area about a quarter mile down the trail. She did not bark, however, when we got to the junction with Red Rock Valley, which is the route on which I planned to return. I stopped to water the dog. It was then I smelled a putrid smell that smelled like something dead was nearby. Normally, Coco would seek out such a scent, given that she loved to roll in the most disgusting things imaginable, but she stayed by my side. We hiked down the Red Rock Valley, which was a scenic route that follows a small creek with wild flowers and elephant ears in abundance. At the bottom of the valley, we waded through Canyon Creek in order to return to the parking lot. It is then that I smelled the same putrid smell I smelled earlier. Over 2,000 feet above the Pacific Crest Trail. Could we have been followed all the way down the valley by a Sasquatch without detecting it? The next experience, also in the Marble Mountains, was the most compelling of all, since it involved a brief sighting from 0914 to 917, 2013. I led a group of four backpackers, two men, two women, along with my new Black Lab, Zuri, to the to the Cudahy Lakes Basin, C-U-D-D-I-H-Y, Cudahy Lakes Basin, on the western side of MMW. Sadly, Coco had passed away from cancer in 2010. We took off from the Hay Press Trailhead to discover that our trek to the basin was long and steep. We stopped for a break on on Sandy Ridge above Meteor Lake, which is down a steep trail in the deep basin below. As we gratefully unmounted our backpacks and partook at water and of water and energy snacks, one of the women asked curiously, <clears throat> excuse me, who's that naked white guy down at the lake? I didn't initially respond to her question because I was sitting down enjoying our respite. When she asked the same question again, I peered over the edge of the ridge to, to spot for perhaps two or three seconds an upright, white, not flesh-colored, being walking on two legs from the water's edge into a group of trees 
The being was thin, with a somewhat pointed head, and appeared to be about six or seven feet in height. The woman stated when she finally... The woman stated when she initially saw the being, it was crouched and drinking water from the lake with cupped hands. Big time pattern there, right? My friend Paul asked if I wanted to hike down to Meteor Lake to investigate and set up camp. I felt uneasy about this idea and I said I did not. As we continued out the ridge, a loud roar slash growl came from down below at the lake. Paul responded by trying to mimic the sound, and another roar responded from down below. Paul would later say he thought the roar slash growls from a bear, but what the woman, the women, the woman and I saw was no bear. We eventually made it to Cudahy Lakes, a most beautiful area to camp. There are four lakes in this basin. Some of us went swimming while Paul tried his luck at fishing. He was rewarded with a with four fat rainbow trout, which we happily consumed for dinner. As nightfall approached, several deer wandered into the area of our camp to hang out, showing no fear of being around humans. That night, as Zuri and I slept in our tent, we both were awakened by the sound of heavy footsteps in our campsite. Then something large ran past our tent and leapt into the air. As it landed on the ground about 50 feet away, we could feel the vibration in the ground under our tent. Zuri went on point, but did not bark much as Coco hadn't in my earlier experience. When I told the group about it the next day, Paul replied that it was probably one of the deer that hung around our campsite the night before, but I didn't think so. It sounded much bigger than a deer, and all the deer were gone the next morning. The final day, we awoke to heavy rain. I made the executive decision we should pack up camp and hike the nine miles back to the trailhead rather than spend the day in the cold and the slop. As we hiked down Sandy Ridge, the two girls, who were younger and more fit than Paul and I, took the lead and were out of sight. We all made it back to the car, soaked and cold, but grateful that we were finally in the warmth of Paul's forerunner. Appropriately, we decided to stop at the Bigfoot Diner in Willow Creek for some comfort food before driving the six hours home, and during the meal, the girls asked if we had seen the tracks that crossed the trail on the way back to the car. We said we had not because we were mostly focused on getting someplace warm and dry. We thought they were pulling our legs because of the experiences we had had earlier, but it was clear they were not making this up. They said a set of human-like tracks about 18 inches long came down up the mountain across the trail before heading into the forest below. When we asked why they didn't photograph the tracks, they said they wanted to get back to the trailhead as much as Paul and I did, and they figured we couldn't have missed them. Maybe Paul and I just missed those tracks, or maybe the rain washed them out. I guess I'll never know. The final experience occurred during a backpack trip to Hancock Lake in the Marble Mountains from July 20th to July 24th, 2014. I was joined in this hike by my four-legged Zuri and a couple from my meet-up backpacking group. And this is a grueling hike to one of the, one of the remotest and deepest lakes in the wilderness. After spending three nights camped by the lake, we decided it was time to hike out when a dense, heavy fog caused the temperatures to plummet more than 30 degrees. We took the snow slide gulch trail out from the lake, which was a different route than we took in. The trail is very steep with multiple switchbacks. Zuri and I were faster than our companions going downhill and soon were about a quarter mile ahead of them. As we rounded a corner of a switchback, Something big just off the trail to our right bolted away uphill from us. I could hear heavy footsteps as whatever this was fled, but I could not see it. Before I had a chance to stop her, Zuri took off in pursuit of whatever this thing was. She ran up the steep hill in the direction of the footsteps were heading, and soon she was out of sight. She didn't run behind trees as the hillside was mostly dry grass and shrubs. It's like she just disappeared. I began to panic. I called frantically for her to return, fearful that I might never see her again. I called for her several minutes, and suddenly I saw her running back down the hillside in my direction, appearing seemingly out of nowhere. I was freaked out, and I did not understand what had just happened. 
When my companions caught up, I explained what had just happened, and the man replied that it was probably just a bear. But bears don't disappear into thin air. Upon further thought, after listening to other accounts on your website, Steve, I believe my dog may have followed a Sasquatch into a portal. I'm extremely grateful that she was returned to me unharmed. I know this is a long email. Hopefully it will provide information for others that may be helpful. About the only person who believes me when I recount these experiences is my wife. Family members, even after asking me to recount my encounters, usually roll their eyes and ignore what I say, interrupt me, or just write it off as me seeing bears. This is very frustrating. I live in Utah now, and I haven't had any new experiences here. This is probably because I've aged out of backpacking. I'm 74 now, and and haven't found any backpackers my age with which to spend overnight in the backcountry. I'm not comfortable going by myself anymore, but there certainly are a lot of reports of encounters here in the Beehive State. Thank you, Steve. Please keep up the good work of letting people's voices be heard. You're a beacon of light in dark times. Greg in Utah. Greg, I appreciate you taking your valuable time to email us all that. Share that with the world through me, man. I would be surprised if somebody pipes up in the comment section below and offers up to go backpacking with you. There's a lot of people from Utah here. A lot. There's a lot of shit going on in Utah. Family members rolling their eyes. Oh, well. <laughs> right? Oh, uh, well. All you got to do is send them a handful of these videos and they'll stop rolling their eyes. More than likely, unless it just terrifies the shit out of them, right? But there you go. There's a whole pile more. Now this one, excuse me. All right. Um, Where am I? What am I after here? <clears throat> excuse me. All right, now back in the big, very, very beginnings, 2019. Holy shit, you guys. 2019. Now, there's a guy, <clears throat> excuse me, I believe I received an email from Robert Kennedy from British Columbia. And I can't remember if it was while I was away or before I was away. And you wanted to have a talk with me and you left your number. And for the life of me, I can't find that freaking email. I've gone into all of my email addresses, typed in Robert, typed in Kennedy, nothing. But I did come up with this, which is one of the original emails. And this is why I'm curious to speak with you. If you want to speak with me and have an update, <clears throat> excuse me. And it's titled your last video about Robert. This is a reminder video email, right? We may have read this, may have not. We'll see. And this is from your past friend, Ricardo. We mailed in quite a bit. Hey, Steve. Thank you for sharing that story. That money taker really did F him around. I was kicked out of them because when I sent in my report, money taker wouldn't publish it. I think because of how much I proved that Robert was the one who was able to make things happen with these beings. So I shared a condensed version of it on the forum and money taker responds by saying that he just wants to remind everyone that I had my experience because the BF loser O had called in the Sasquatch the week before. I responded by saying the Sasquatch were always there. It was Robert's familiarity with them and their habits and reactions to him that they were so readily willing to interact. He comes back and goes on a rant about how he and the organization have put years into research and observation. If it wasn't for their paid expeditions, nobody would be experiencing anything. <laughs> oh boy, what a damaged human. It went back and forth a couple more times and suddenly I was out of the forum. I couldn't sign in anymore. Go figure. Just thinking about that money-hungry, knob-gobbling, self-important, manipulative piece of shit gives me an effing headache. That's a pattern. <laughs> Robert is dyslexic. 
And that piece of shit took advantage of the fact that he was a hard, he has a hard time of communicating and getting things straight in his head at times. Money Taker even accused him of stealing from him when, in fact, that it was he that stole from Robert. What a piece of crap. And then those Belgian movie Fs. Robert called me and asked if I wouldn't mind being interviewed, and he asked if I wouldn't mind sending him another copy of the video that I shot with the wood knocking and whooping interaction. Oh, do you got a video of that stuff? No way. I told them that I didn't want any part of the documentary and that he needed to be careful with these guys. I told him to watch his back with them in case they tried to make him look like some kind of a, a loon. When the movie was finished, he was so excited. He called me to send me a link to the trailer for it. I can't remember what it's called. I looked up clips and I wasn't impressed. But I didn't want to say that to him. One of the clips in the trailer shows him standing on top of a small hill doing a whooping call, and it wasn't flattering. I was afraid that it made him look foolish. But like Buddy said in the email that you read, these guys won awards at film festivals, and Robert was forgotten, except that he started getting more people from Europe staying at the campground. They worked their asses off cleaning that place up, and the government screwed him and his family big time. ex pro Prieted it after he, Deb, and the kids did all the work on it. It was heartbreaking. Alright, so you've lost contact with him. Don't know where he is. There you go. That's an older email. And, Robert, if you want to talk to the world about everything that you've experienced, what you know, and what you what may have changed since then, what you know now, if you had any more experiences or what, we're into it. I'm curious, and I'm, I'm I'm interested in hearing it, and uh, email me again, all right? Share my story at howtohunt.com. You got some truth you want to share? I'm a good place to share it, all right? Anyway, that might have been a confusing email. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but it needed to be shared. Found that this morning while diving into the, all over my, all over the shop in my multiple inboxes. Here's another email titled, I really feel I've found two very important puzzle pieces that you might be interested in. All right. Let's get into it. Hi, my name is Alan Finnegan. I come from Dublin in Ireland. I believe I came across two puzzle pieces which I feel we have been looking for. When is who they are? And the other one is and also where they come from, came from. This is my first time writing into you because I feel strongly about the subject. And if I'm right, it could be a game change. I recently came across your channel, which called YouTube. He believes ne Neanderthals were very aggressive and almost white and almost white hope he Typos. I think you meant almost wiped Homo sapiens to extinction. Apparently, they were our favorite food and like to hunters for sport, where they claimed there wasn't many Homo sapiens left in the world. Day stating caves during the day. <laughs> okay, there's some freaking typos in here. I think you meant they were staying in caves during the day and the sun, heart, their big black eyes suited for a scene of the dark. All right, enough. Alan, do me a small favor. Email me that email again and proofread it. Okay, man, that one's going way too nasty with the typos. I'm not going to continue anymore because I'm going to take everybody over the edge of frustration and myself. But I absolutely appreciate you reading in reading in, emailing in, and send it again, all right, man? Straighten it out, and we'll read it again. This next one's titled, Story. I'd like to start out by thanking you for sharing all your stories, both Sasquatch and your hunting experiences. The last story you read really rang home to me. I had a story happened to me when I was younger that mimicked this very closely. I was 16, I believe. We had a hunting camp in the Panhandle of Florida. One of your 
One of our stands was back in a cypress swamp along an old dried up creek bed. That particular evening, the moon was full and shining just right to be able to see clearly down the creek bed, even though it was after dark, so I decided to stay sitting a little later than I normally would. After a little bit, I decided it was too late to sh shoot. I didn't want my papa wondering why I hadn't come out of the woods yet, so I got down. And once you step out of the cypress, you get to a stand of thick pines. Once I got in there, I heard like something following me, keeping almost perfect pace with me. I stopped, it stopped. I started walking, it started walking. I stopped again and shined my small flashlight, but couldn't see anything, so I thought it must be a hog or a deer, not knowing what I was, so I yelled at it. When I yelled, it started walking toward me again. At that point, I didn't know what came over me, but I ran faster than I've ever ran before and got out of there. I didn't share it with anyone for a couple of weeks. I didn't want anyone to know something scared me enough to make me run out of the woods. The next morning, Papa asked if I wanted to sit back there again, and I just told him I wanted to sit in a different spot. So he back, so he sat back in that stand. A couple of weeks later, on our drive back to deer camp, I asked him if he had anything to follow him out of the woods at that stand. And he said, actually, he did. The afternoon after it happened to me, and I told him about it. We used to joke about it, being haunted back there, or it was Bigfoot but never really knew what it was. But that last story you shared sounded a lot like mine. Maybe it really was a Sasquatch, but I don't know for sure. I wish you the best of luck with the project you're working on. Thank you, Robert Rudolph. Robert, appreciate you, man. That was Actually, that's an older email, whatever. Um, and that is a very, very strong pattern. And we do know that it is these people because we had, we've had numerous people have that happen and then they saw them. One guy specifically I remember stands out. He was walking back down a dark road. Thing was in the timber beside him. Did the old same old shit. Walk fast. Stop. And then they took. They stopped. But they took one extra step. After paralleling you for some time. And then he kept going. And he knew there was an opening coming up on the right. And he was going to keep going straight. But there's a complete opening in the timber. Where if that thing was going to be coming. It was going to cross that opening. And it did. And then it was your classic description. So there we go. Yes, it's them pacing us in the woods. Why do they do it? Don't know. Don't know. There's a lot of speculation. This one's titled, What Else? Question mark. Partridge season started here in northwest Ontario about a week back. Out I go. First road is gravel. Been raining a week. No other tire tracks on the road. Stopped at the first cut line. Nothing, zero tire marks. 30k out of town. And town is about 1,000 people. 50 yards in the cut line. I see tracks on an ant nest by the side of that trail. Flat, sandy, about an inch higher than the rest of the ground around it. On the edge, one front part of a foot. The back part was still in the grass and hard gravel, so nothing showing. The front part, toes and pad clearly visible. Full track, dead center on the ant nest. I wear a 13 Brit. US is a tad smaller. Who cares, just saying. The length was roughly one inch longer than my boot. Three and a half inches across at the heel, close to five across the toes. The big toe stuck out about 45 degrees off square, left foot. Again, who the hell cares? Now I have a pretty hot shot camera with about 5,000 features on it. First time in a couple of years I actually remembered to bring it with. SD card? No. Stupid bastard. There's a backup storage built in. It holds, I don't know, 10, a dozen pictures. I got two pictures before it was full. And both just fail to impress. Full disclosure. I can turn the bastard on and I can turn it off. After a dozen tries, I can make it shoot macro and other such things. But I stumble across those details and honestly, I never know what I just did to get there. I should have been able to dump the stored pics, but not a clue how to do it. Cut me some slack. My first camera was a brownie. 
and technically I peaked right there. A dozen or more picks would have given enough different angles to be meaningful, but 90 odd percent at the ant nest was fine sand. Rain for a week. The edges were the edges were razor sharp. The toes sunk in about an inch. Now, first thought, bear track. Right rear. Stepped on halfway by a left front, again with a slightly cockeyed big toe. But no real visual marker that that's what happened. I looked. On my knees, glasses on, glasses off, as said, a razor's edge around the whole print. Not a dent in the sand anywhere that showed a claw mark, or even a tiny spot that could be one. An inch deep at the front of the toes. I discussed the event with a friend, XMNR, with a phone full of bear tracks. Don't we all? Professional opinion? Huh? That's weird. That's all I got on that. Not quite enough for the lecture tour. My camera needs a total reset. Just waiting for my wife to love me enough to do it. Sorry, I couldn't do better. When you decide to solve the flying saucer de debacle, I can do better. 75, maybe 76, I saw a 25 to maybe 30 footer at no more than 150 yards for maybe 5 to 10 minutes total. Running at 2 to 3 miles per hour, about 20 feet off the center of the lake, my mom's house overlooked. It continued till out of sight around a corner within yards of my neighbor's farmhouse about a half mile down the lake. Flashing lights out of the dome. Eventually noticed the lights were immediately followed by two different lights much higher up. Blip, blip, blip. Bullshitting asshole, right? The power was obviously electromagnetic. It sounded like a martial amp set on stun. Anyone ever listened at band practice knows that exact sound. Reason I saw it was I'd heard it several minutes before seeing it, and being a long haired nayer do well playing in a rock band, the living room upstairs over overlooking the lake was full of gear, and we'd practiced earlier. I assumed an amp was left on and about to blow. Nope. Why am I bugging you? Because I think you know how effed up things like this make you feel. I may be a grumpy, foul-mouthed old bastard, but strangely, I don't lie. Too damn many dead ancestors watching me. I enjoy your show immensely. I was 25 years a sailor. Worked the oil patch, a bit of logging construction. All great till the parts break. Take care and take no shit. <laughs> there you go. All right, Matt. I don't think, no, there's no photograph included. No big deal, but I get it. I understand exactly what you saw, and I'm picking up what you're putting down. And another person who observed a UFO, which of there is possibly, who knows how many human beings have seen these freaking things in the sky. But unfortunately, the majority of the population thinks they need to ask the government for answers, where that is the most incorrect, absolute, false hood ever. We don't need nothing from those sons of bitches. Not them. Probably another group. I don't know if you can hear that. That's my stomach growling. Holy cow. Who's next? Sasquatch. All right. My name is Robert. My story began at a forested university-owned piece of land that I've been visiting for 13 years of my life. I know like the back of my hand at this point anyway. And this was about three to four years going into these woods. And mind you, they aren't big. Maybe three city blocks by two or so. Sorry, I don't know how to guess acreage or anything. But anyway, I just learned some basics of Sasquatch from a gr friend of mine. A grind of mine? A friend of mine, I think you meant. We'll call him Jay. We were at this camp being run by the university for kids. I was about nine or so, and every single one of us kids pretty much were playing in the woods in this giant tree structure that I, that I literally, as I'm typing this, just realized that the logs were so damn big, there's no way humans put them like that. So we come out of the woods, finally, because the leaders told us we had other stuff to do. A couple minutes later or so, I was looking in the same woods area again, and I saw a hairy 
head and shoulders, walking away from a small clearing where it would have had a, where it would have had a very clear view of us kids. Needless to say, I knew from then on. That was about ten or so years ago. Sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Needless to say, I knew from then on. And that was about 10 or so years ago. And now I've seen clear video footage of their faces and then in general. So my adult mind knows now, but I've never had another face-to-face -face encounter. And I was so young at the time, I wasn't scared. So I think I'd be okay with having a peaceful interaction with one of them. And who knows? Maybe make a, maybe make a friend, ha <laughs> ha. And yes, I'm freaking serious. I'm cool with these beings. Being real, just like anything else. They're just animals. And from all the legends I've heard and the story from blank blank on YouTube, a subscriber, M1, saving his two daughters and wife from a car crash, yeah, you can bet they'll be your friend if you're not hostile, it seems. Thanks. You can share my name because F the haters. All right, there's a bunch of typos in the end. No biggie. We got it. This is a... Is it just me or has this been an awkward morning? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Anyway. All right. I'm going to go one more. All right. One more. And then I'm going to get moving. Solo mountain bike overnight encounters a tireless email. I've made several overnight stays at a nature preserves using a hammock, tarp, and mountain bike. It's a great way to relax. I don't sleep much being a 22-year-old veteran. Tw sorry, I don't sleep much being a 22-year veteran. But on these trips, trips I sleep like a baby. Sometimes more than six hours straight. I do zero impact camping. No evidence, no evidence, no fire. I had an encounter with something. I've always doubted it was a Bigfoot, but the more I listen to stories, the more I research, I just can't seem to explain it away. It was late in the day on this trip, November time frame. I had my high output LEDs on the bike because it was getting dark. I found a nice pair of trees and a small clearing on top of a hill. I set up my hammock with the tarp in a raised position so I could see around. I didn't think it would rain and there was no wind. It was a cloudy night, no moonlight. With my headlamp off, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. I had my DS DLSR camera and a tripod. Tried some low light shots. They were coming out just black, so I gave up on taking photos and stowed my camera gear. I don't go armed, it's a very liberal area. All I have is a pair of hiking poles to defend myself. Been having a lot of coyote encounters. So this night I removed the headlight from my bike and hung it on my ridge line. Eighteen hundred lumens, very bright. <clears throat> Excuse me, I figured a I figured a blind coyote would not have would not be much of a threat. As usual, once it's dark, the woods come alive, stuff moving everywhere. You could hear the craziest sounds. There's no doubt in my mind the animals in the woods communicate very well. They always seem to know I'm there, and some are curious and come close. As they close in, they are usually making some kind of a noise, which is repeated at a distance by a second animal. On this night, something heavy was moving toward me. It wasn't the typical rustle of leaves or shuffling. It was slow and methodical. Step, step, pause. Step, step, pause. After a long pause, there was a sudden and incredibly loud thump. Like somebody took a giant baseball bat and whacked it against the ground. Now I figured I must have some large buck trying to get, trying to get a start out of me. I decided to let him get within... I decided to let him get within about 15 feet, then hit him with the light, so I can have a good look at what it is. Now the approach was two steps, and they whack. Step, step, whack. Long pause. Step, step, whack. Man, this was crazy. This thing just kept getting closer. I turned on the light and two orange eyes sat high in the air. They dropped low to the ground, then started to swing methodically back and forth. 
all I could see was the eyes. There was some very, very light brush in that direction, but I really don't understand why I did not get a reflection from the body. The eyes moved back and forth, kind of like a snake getting ready to strike. I figured that was enough, and I turned the light off. This thing took off like some kind of rocket. In five bounds, it must have been a half a mile away. I heard several of the same interactions I had heard earlier that night. Some weird squawking-like sounds back and forth from different directions. Then all was quiet, and I went to sleep. I always wrote this off as a, as a deer. I can't find anybody that has had a similar encounter with a deer. With this massive amount of time you have in the wilderness, you must have had something similar happen, especially if it was just a deer. Let me know what you think. I still think it was a deer. <laughs> Don't use my name if you do read this. I'm not supposed to be staying out in the nature preserves past dark. Really? Seriously? You mean by law? Hmm. Yeah, well, that's odd. There you go. Shared. What do I think? No, it wasn't a deer. You know what it was. You knew what it was before you started typing here, man. It wasn't a deer. And there's a lot of rules in the U.S. in the forest, isn't there? There's a lot of real creepy freaking rules. I've heard from a lot of my hunters that have come up and have guided, you know, you have to stay on whatever trails you can to have anything with a motor, not even a chainsaw. Um, I've heard that the fishing game guys come into your camp and you get a fine. Like one guy said he left a Snickers bar on his bunk in his tent. Didn't put in his backpack for the day by accident. And the game wardens that showed up when they got back to camp and they scoured the camp, found the Snickers bar and rode them up. <laughs> oh my God. Rules and regulations, right? Control, control, control. I say ram it up your asses to those people who do that. But anyway, that's another topic. I'll bite my lip. Anyway, all right. This feels like an awkward morning. I don't know why, but I'm going to get my ass in gear and get a bunch of my stuff going. And, uh, Let's see if we can't get somebody in here pretty quick. We did a lot of work in here yesterday. A lot of shit went down yesterday. And uh, I got to get a lot of stuff done today. What else? A um, bunch of people are starting to inquire about fishing with me this summer. And if you want to do that, you can email Sarah at book it at howtohunt.com, I think, for Salmon Halibut. But I'm not sure what's going to go down this year. I got a funny feeling. I don't know. We'll see what's coming, right? There's there's so much nasty ass shit going on right now. But like somebody emailed earlier and said, or ways of pod where they said that it's like it's like having uh, it's having to fix all the leaks in a boat. You have to see all the leaks before you can fix them. So possibly we have to see all of the dark, crazy ass shit before it can be fixed. And that's what's happening right now around the world, right? But what I'm getting at is, I'm not so certain that a lot of people are going to be traveling too much this summer and going on fishing charters. I don't know. I don't know. I got a, I have a, my guts just screaming that something's up, something's coming. But maybe I'm wrong. So if it isn't coming and I'm wrong and you want to come fishing with me, you can email Sarah at book it at howtohunt.com and line that up. I'm not sure what days I'm fishing. I have a clue. She's got all written down. I got too much on the go. But I know there are some days available anyway. But we'll see what's coming down the pipe this year, right? We'll see what's coming down the pipe. Anyway, I'm rambling all over the freaking chart. I guess my brain's scrambling. I got too much to do, so I got to go. Share my story at howtohunt.com. And Robert Kennedy, if you're listening right now, man, email me. All right, email me and uh, let's get a bunch of your knowledge shared with all the people. Maybe we'll do it on a Zoom thing and and uh, do it in person, all right? I'm going to start doing that with a lot of people. So I know there's a lot of people I, in the past, I wanted to get in contact with. And then as I go, like how many how many new people I'm, am I hearing from? Every single day, right? Every single day. So many. So many people need to be heard. We're getting them heard. Share my story at howtohunt.com. I'll be back tomorrow, no matter what.